the social, economic, and political setup of the Kenyan people in the 19th century. Bantus, the Agikuyu. It is the next Saturday and Luanda has made his way back to the museum to see Dr. Griffin. Even though it is the weekend, he enjoyed their discussion and is looking forward to more in-depth discussion about the groups of Kenya in the 19th century. Hello, Dr. Griffin. It is good to see you, Rafiki Yangu. Oh, you actually showed up? It's, is that bad? Not at all. I am pleasantly surprised. I mean, with the football games going on. Oh, none of my teams are playing. I had to find something to do. Thank you, Luanda. I must ask, why are you so interested in looking more in-depth of the organization of Kenyan people? Well... I was watching the news the other day, and it came up that the Sambiru people still practice traditional female circumcision. Mm. This got me thinking of what practices the Luos did in the past, such as the removal of the six lower teeth, and even started to get me thinking of all the groups in Kenya we discussed. It also got me thinking that these small differences between the groups should not be enough to keep us separated, and instead we need to embrace our uniqueness that makes us ultimately Kenyan. Wow, that is a very mature answer, Luanda, and I am so impressed. You are so correct that while our groups may be different in a few practices, we are still human and Kenyan and need to work together to improve our lives. Now, I was hoping we could get out of the museum and talk in the park. Perfect. What are we waiting for? All right. We can talk and walk, walk and talk, you know. Okay. I would like to start with my personal group, if that is okay. The Agikuyu. I will be testing you to see if you still remember their past migration. Easy. They are an eastern Bantu group that came from the south to migrate around the Mount Kenya area where they are today. Nice job. I will detail how we are socially organized. You see, the family is the main unit, with many families making up a clan. We have a right of age passage, such as circumcision. It happens to a group of boys, which makes up an age set group. So, number age didn't really matter. It was more of when events and ceremonies happened. Like, a 13-year-old could be in the same group as a 17-year-old? That is correct. Mostly, those going through puberty. Now, after the group of boys have been initiated, they are now their own rika. They are now junior warriors that protect the clan from outside attacks. It would make sense that these boys form a strong bond especially going through rituals as circumcision, this makes a sense of brotherhood. That is correct, and that is the point. The previous junior warriors now become the senior warriors, and the cycle continues on and on. Now, the name for our one supreme god is Ngai, who we believe lives on, on Mount Kenya or Mount Kirinyaga. There are other specific priests, Murathi, who had roles such as offering sacrifices, interpreting God's message, and seeing into the future. The medicine man also exists called Mundu Mugo, who looked after the sick and got rid of evil spirits in the village. Hmm. The priest and medicine men must have had some influential roles in the clan's politics. That is true. I mentioned before that the family was the main component of the clan. The father was the head of the family. This is known as a patriarchal society. Pay who? I mean patriarchal means men are the leaders of the group discussed. Now, in this case, they are Gikuyu. Now, the many families come together to make up a clan 
and they stay together within a certain area or territory known as Mbari. And I'm guessing there were elders in this clan? Yes, there were elders known as Kiyama who had a central chairman or a leader known as Muramati. Their main roles were to solve land and inheritance disputes such as if a father passed, what children get what. They had a role also in administering justice, helping settle civil and criminal problems, and also, as mentioned earlier, they assisted in religious ceremonies. Was there any group that had more authority than them? Mm, there was a group of senior elders known as Kiyama Kiandundu that was selected and served as a high court of appeal when needed. Who paid them for these jobs? Funny boy, money in Kenya wasn't really used until the mid-19th century, like around 1850. This came from the Arab traders and started along the coast, as history has it. The Agikuyu mostly grew crops such as sorghum, millet, bananas, beans, and more. Men cleared the land while women tilled that land. So they didn't have animals? They did. They kept animals like cattle, sheep, and goats, but crops were their main thing. They also traded their livestock and crops for items they didn't have, such as grain, tobacco, iron tools, and baskets with their ridge neighbors. Remember, they were near Mount Kenya. There were even markets set up around Kiambu, Karatina, and Muthili. This was between Agekuyu, small clans? Uh, that is correct. Like I said, they were neighboring ridges. Now, for their external neighbors, they got honey and ivory from the Ogie community. They also got iron tools, cotton cloths, and glass beads from the Akamba. They even traded with the Maasai, but this was done only by women of the groups having a male translator. Oh, so this took place around Norak, Kajiado, and Nyanyuki. Did they have special internal skills? Of course. There were great blacksmiths making iron tools like knives and axes. The men and women had different roles. Men would hunt and gather for food, while women would weave and make baskets and pots. They even kept bees and made drums for instruments. Drums? Why drums? Drums make noise. And noise is important for dance, rituals, war, religion, and just fun to have it. Mm, that is true. Ah, we are at the park. Let me grab some Maji. I will get Simsim. Mm. 